of warriors and heroes. Our modern picture of medieval war is often filled with positive ideas about knights being brave and fair. In movies, heroic stories, video games, and medieval festivals, we see brave fighters in shining armor who boldly charge at each other. This kind of war doesn't seem dirty or brutal. It seems more like a sport or a game. When a prince faces a noble opponent, helpers prepare the horses and hand the heroes their lances. Then a lively duel begins, ending with the prince's victory, but not with the death of the losing knight. Only when fighting enemies of lower rank does death become cruel. In these stories, only those who deserve it die in war. The noble knights need to prove themselves in battle. Fighting makes them heroes. Clearly, there is a close link between war and becoming a hero. It's wars, or more precisely, the stories about wars, that turn men into heroes. This explains a lot about why war fascinates us and can be entertaining. War entertains, and it did so even in the Middle Ages. It was often sung about and became a topic in history books, poems, epic tales, and courtly novels. This complicated way of handling the topic brings opportunities, risks, and side effects when studying medieval war. Interest in war provides historians with many sources. However, many medieval texts about war tend to present it heroically and make it seem less severe. They focus on the knightly fighters, while other participants play only minor roles. The authors often ignore the misery of war and its victims and aim to create heroes. But we look beyond the hero stories and focus on the real war. Besides the knights, we will also show the darker characters, not as harmless bullies, but as people who carried out deadly violence. Many medieval historical accounts have as much to do with the wars of their time as Hollywood movies have with the wars of the 20th century. It's not just about fighting for victory and honor. The painful consequences also play an important role. Not only the shining knights are heard, the victims of the brutal conflicts are also presented. In wars and war stories, many things were made up and glorified. Each side tried to show itself in the best light to praise its deeds and to insult the enemy. Talking about war is always about perspective. Winners often tell very different stories than losers. The bias in historical writing becomes especially clear when it comes to this topic. As a major event in people's lives, and as something remembered by future generations, war is rarely looked at without emotion. We often find accounts that, in one way or another, hide the cruel reality, or try to find a specific meaning in the events. Heroes are created, defeats are dealt with, or victories are celebrated. So the enemy's successes are downplayed, our own losses are minimized and people are blamed for our own side's failures. The losers write their own history and eventually come to an untrue version of what happened. In the Middle Ages, there wasn't only biased historical writing about war. We also find its classic and timeless companions, lies and propaganda. Medieval commanders also tried to spread their version of events in announcements to get support from home. For this, they made their own achievements look better or made the enemy look bad. If even people at the time had a distorted view of medieval wars, what about our modern understanding? If we want to write history, we depend on the sources that tell us about the past, so we always have to try to find and fix distortions. When you do this, war becomes much bloodier and more cruel. What is the Middle Ages? The Middle Ages is a historical time period that many people like. In lots of films, books, exhibitions, and events, the Middle Ages, or what people think of as the Middle Ages, is shown very vividly. War also has its firm place in this fascination with the Middle Ages. Many groups have set themselves the goal of recreating medieval warfare as realistically as possible. They focus mainly on clothing and weapons, which they often remake in great detail based on medieval pictures and archaeological finds. Compared to that, 
the war presented here is much more cruel and bloody. When I talk about the Middle Ages in this audiobook, I mean the time between 500 and 1500 AD, though sometimes I might mention things before or after these dates. In terms of war history, these dates roughly point to the time after the wars of the Roman Empire and before the wars of the early modern period, which used more and more guns. In the Middle Ages, wars mostly happened face to face, and full time professional armies were rare rather than common. What is a war in the Middle Ages, and how big were the armies? Today we have many definitions of the word war, but medieval writers didn't worry about defining it. For them, war was a violent conflict between armed groups aiming to defeat each other. Importantly, these groups were of a certain size, but you shouldn't imagine huge armies. Often, only a few hundred men faced each other. In medieval sources, there's no precise difference between war, battle, campaign, skirmish, and other fights. Formal separations between times of war and peace didn't always exist. Just like today, people in the Middle Ages saw war as a time with special conditions and laws. War wasn't without rules, but it followed different ones than peace. We can learn about army sizes mainly from two types of sources. First, from historical writings. Second, from saved payrolls or other records from medieval military administration, like muster rolls. But these are rare. This is especially true for warlords who had a good administration and detailed military bureaucracy, like the English monarchy in the 14th and 15th centuries. Of course, these records don't tell us exactly how many soldiers fought, because losses during the march, desertions, and other incidents aren't included. In battle descriptions, Chroniclers often noted how many fighters faced each other. But these numbers are usually not very reliable. Often, the historians couldn't know the exact numbers, and the figures are more like symbols. Even if they witnessed a battle, that doesn't help much. It's very hard to estimate the size of a crowd just by looking. This is especially true for the enemy army and the confusion during a battle. Only if the historian knew about the army's organization and administration could they give more precise numbers? But this was rare. It's very hard to estimate the size of a crowd just by looking. This is especially true for the enemy army and the confusion during a battle. Only if the historian knew about the army's organization and administration could they provide more precise numbers. But this was rare. Also, it's doubtful whether any participant of a campaign or battle knew exactly how many fighters were on one side, but even if a historian had reliable numbers, it doesn't mean they wrote them down accurately. Numbers could be used to create certain effects in historical accounts. For example, we lost because we were fewer, and the others were many. Even though we were so few, we defeated the enemy's large army. The large number of our troops shows how many supporters we had. The size of medieval armies was limited by the financial power of the warlord, who had to pay wages and also provide some food and equipment for his fighters. They simply didn't have the resources for large armies like those in ancient or modern times. Compared to ancient and modern armies, medieval forces were smaller. Recruiting troops happened either through an obligation based on men's social position. But this was never as widespread as in ancient or modern times or warlords used paid soldiers and mercenaries. Often, it was the same groups of people who had joined at the beginning of a campaign because they had to, who now got paid. When the feudal duty ended and the war wasn't over yet, the fighters had to be paid for their services. But mercenaries in the classic sense were also used. These were foreign experts who made their living from war. They often had a bad reputation because they fought professionally and only cared about money, and also because they were foreigners. Mercenaries became a problem for their warlords when the money ran out or the fighting was over. Then they had to find a job elsewhere. The Army as a Network In the Middle Ages, power was mostly based on personal contacts and happened face to face. Modern armies are structured with military ranks and roles 
In theory, every soldier knows at all times who is in command over whom, even if many officers and leaders are lost. There is always a hierarchy. In a medieval army, things were different. We don't have details about how orders were given or who commanded whom in medieval troops. These details were so normal for medieval writers that they didn't mention them. Fighters were often recruited through family ties and rulers. A nobleman would call upon men from his family and the land he controlled to fulfill his duties to his king. The military groups formed this way focused on their social leader. He was responsible for paying them and was their lord or head of the family. This kind of social bond organized every medieval army. It was a social structure where the king held the most important position. He was also the leader of every military action he took part in. People have compared the structure of a medieval army to a network. A modern example of such a network is a country's flight connections. Individual airports are like nodes where a region's traffic comes together. Certain large airports act as major hubs that connect the country with international air traffic. For every position in the network, there is first a regional point of reference. From there, connections go to a larger hub. In a similar way, you can imagine a medieval army. Each fighter looks first to the leader of their group. The higher point of reference for these group leaders, who usually had important social positions, is the commander of the army like the king. The network structure helped communication within the troops. Especially because they lacked good communication tools, a network secured the flow of information more efficiently than a straight-line setup. This kind of structure meant that medieval armies were very vulnerable when leaders were lost. If you remove a node from a network, the system loses its structure and doesn't work as well. The king as a war leader. When you look at the political history of the Middle Ages, it seems like wars were fought almost all the time. War was the normal state, and when there was no war, people felt it needed an explanation. If a king wasn't going to war, he would at least go hunting. Hunting wasn't just a fun pastime for medieval nobles. Early historians used it as a symbol to show that a king's rule was working well because it demonstrated his ability to act like a warrior. Both hunting and war required skill in riding horses and using weapons. In both activities, the same groups took part, the king, his court, and the high-ranking nobles of the kingdom. So, hunting and war shared the same public stage where a king could, and had to, prove his abilities. War was very important for kingship. In the Middle Ages, Kings led their troops into battle and took an active part in fighting. At least, that was the expectation many historians had for their kings. This expectation is shown in many stories where their own king is praised for courage and bravery, while the enemy king is accused of cowardice and failure in battle. A king had to be constantly warlike and successful. Military victories gave the king prestige and fame. In war, a king could gain or lose much more than just personal reputation. Wars were fought over land and power. They also brought loot to the winner. The money from a successful war came mainly from plundering and ransom payments. War could be good business, even if the costs for equipment or soldiers' pay were high. For kings, wars were always a way to keep the social elite loyal through loot and profit. A good king proved to his subjects that his rule was profitable, that it was worth following him. A good king proved to his subjects that his rule was profitable, that it was worth following him. For the fighters, it wasn't crucial that everyone returned from war rich with loot. What mattered was that you could return rich. The chance of being among the lucky ones who came home as successful men outweighed many uncertainties. It was the opportunity not careful calculation that made war attractive. The reasons for going to war were certainly complex. This becomes especially clear in the example of the Crusades. Here, the effort was enormous because the war zone was far away, which made the campaign much longer and increased the costs. Feudal obligations or other legal ties did not exist, at least not for the main leaders among the Crusaders. 
In addition, there was also a religious and social aspect. Even though the Crusades weren't just about religion, we shouldn't overlook faith when trying to understand them. The participants of the Crusades were promised forgiveness of their sins by the Church, called indulgences. There was also the chance to prove oneself as a hero in war. But loot and the prospect of gaining their own land also played a role. Any kind of economic calculation of war is difficult, maybe impossible. The risk of being killed was present in every military venture. Added to this was the risk for the lands they had to leave unprotected at home. Most of the participants in the war probably took up arms without having a choice. They went to war because they were ordered to. This includes, for example, those who were called to defend their country or their city. The Ruler on the Run A defeat didn't just cause political and military setbacks. It also hurt a king's reputation. A clear sign of failure and resulting shame was when a ruler fled from the battlefield. If the king was captured or even killed during a defeat, it was disastrous for the losing side. In the Middle Ages, ruling was based on personal contact, on the person and abilities of the ruler. If a ruler was lost, the whole system of rule began to shake. Often, the loss of a ruler led to the panicked flight of the entire army. It didn't matter whether the king actually died or just fell off his horse. What mattered was that his troops couldn't see him anymore. A battle was always in great danger when the king fell from his horse and his soldiers didn't know if he was alive or not. That's why we have many stories where commanders try hard to show their troops they are still present. For example, during the Battle of Hastings in 1066, when the Norman fighters thought their leader, Duke William, had fallen, they began to flee. But because William showed himself to his men, he was able to stop the retreat, and the conquest of England succeeded. Capturing a king gave the victors huge advantages. They could demand political concessions and financial payments for his release. In the Hundred Years' War between 1337 and 1453, it was disastrous for France when King John the Good was captured at the Battle of Poitiers in 1356. France had to make significant political concessions and give up many lands to England. They also had to pay a ransom of three million écus. Despite these serious consequences, King John's behavior wasn't widely criticized by people of his time. He had refused all his advisors' pleas to leave the battlefield in the face of the looming defeat. To him, retreat was dishonorable. This behavior came from a specific understanding of kingship, bravery, and war. The king was not only the commander, but also an exemplary fighter. Even when retreat might be the smart move, the brave fighter stays and doesn't abandon his men. Here, war is judged not by the outcome and consequences, but by how it is fought. According to these standards, fleeing is dishonorable while holding out in battle is praised as a knightly virtue. Riders and Knights The Middle Ages are generally seen as the time of knights, often in a romanticized way. Knighthood is perhaps the most powerful invention of Western European medieval times. In modern times, there are countless knight movies and spectacles, the figure of the knight even appears as a Jedi in Star Wars films. He fights with lightsabers and follows a code of honor. The fascination with knighthood isn't just a modern thing. It was also a medieval phenomenon. The young Parzival, who was raised by his mother in the wilderness and later goes on a quest for the Holy Grail, throws himself to the ground in awe when he sees the first knights he's ever seen and asks reverently, Are you God? Knights were perceived and portrayed as inspiring figures. This was due to their splendid equipment. A horse with a magnificent saddle blanket, a shining helmet, chainmail armor, lance, and shield. The knights gleam in the sunlight when Parzival sees them. Knights were, first of all, mounted warriors. Their main weapons were the sword and the lance. They protected themselves with a shield and body armor. English military researchers use men-at-arms to refer to fighters who wore armor and rode horses 
this term focuses on their equipment and role in the military, not their social status. Men-at-arms include knights, fighters who aren't knights, mounted ruffians, and mercenaries with the right weapons. For use in combat, social status was initially unimportant. Even without being knighted, a fighter could use a lance, sword, and shield. The term knight is complex and needs explanation. Our modern ideas of medieval knighthood are usually one-sided and focus on a specific aspect of this phenomenon. We see knights as shining heroes who court beautiful women and excel in tournaments and battles. One becomes a knight through a knighting ceremony. A knight is noble and just, bold and honest. This image largely matches what the courtly knightly culture of the 12th and 13th centuries shows us. The reality, especially in medieval warfare, is much more complex. We can distinguish three aspects of medieval knighthood. The military, the social, and the cultural. First, let's look at the origin of knighthood. A knight is, as the word already says, someone who rides on a horse. Without a horse, there is no knight. The noble knighthood goes back to the increasing military importance of mounted combat from about the 8th century. Mounted warriors who fought from horseback were an efficient type of soldier, and in some ways, better than the foot soldiers of their time. This was mainly because they fought from a higher position, had speed, and greater striking power. Because of their equipment, mounted warriors were not only efficient, but also expensive. The high costs for these fighters are why social status and wealth are linked to having a special role in the battle group, which was common in the Middle Ages. The costly equipment made fighting on horseback a privilege of the rich. Over time, a closed group emerged that set itself apart socially and militarily from the other fighters. Knightly Culture Changes in society and the military brought about a courtly knightly culture, the golden age of knighthood, where many parts of life were closely tied to the knight's fighting skills. The way knights presented themselves was clearly focused on warlike things, the horse, the sword, and the shield. In this context, medieval coats of arms, which are family symbols displayed on shields and banners, are also important. To become a knight in the cultural sense, a person went through a ceremony called the Schwertlight, girding of the sword, and later known as the Ritterschlag, knighting. The Schwertlight happened in France before 1100, and the Ritterschlag started in the 13th century. It's important to tell the difference between a knight and a mounted warrior. In theory, every knight was also a mounted warrior, but not every rider who fought on horseback was a knight. There were big gaps between the idealized world of courtly knighthood and real warfare. Many knights did not act very knightly toward defeated enemies. Knighthood, besides its noble code of conduct, also had an economic side. The link between social status and military service could be seen not only as a privilege, but also as a burden. Someone who had the necessary land and income, who belonged economically to the class of knights, did not necessarily want to fight as a knight in war. Feudal obligations allowed a knight to send someone else in his place, so he didn't have to go to war personally. Other nobles refused to become knights with expensive equipment because they didn't want to pay for the costly military service. Knighthood had a heroic, shining side and a practical one, which involved the dangers and uncertainties of war and its economic aspects. War was already expensive for the knight because he usually didn't act alone. Even if the ideal of the heroic knight is a lone warrior, the medieval knight needed helpers. A squire held the lance and shield ready for him, and a servant took care of the horse. A knight needed at least three horses, the war horse which was only used in actual battle, a riding horse, and a horse for the squire and the servant. The Horse as a Status Symbol High up on his horse, the medieval knight towered over his surroundings. This physical height matched his belief in the elevated social status 
This physical height matched his belief in the elevated social status of knighthood. His physical height gave him a sense of superiority over his opponent and fueled his belief in the social status of knighthood. The kind of transportation someone used showed a man's status, and only riding was considered appropriate for a noble. Whoever lost his horse also lost his status as a noble fighter. Whoever lost his horse also lost his status as a noble fighter. The warhorse became a status symbol for several reasons. Warhorses were very expensive because they were specially bred and trained for use in war. Moreover, the importance of the horse to the knight is shown by the fact that in knightly novels of the High Middle Ages, these animals were seen as companions and friends of the heroes and were even given names. The End of the Knights Knights used to fight by charging at the enemy with their lances lowered. As impressive as this was, new developments in warfare by the 14th century set clear limits to this method. European knights learned that they couldn't do much against well-organized groups of foot soldiers. These soldiers simply let the charging knights run into their spears and halberds. This is how the English, especially in the early phase of the Hundred Years' War, won many victories against French knights. Their success was also because archers and mounted warriors worked well together. Everyone involved in the war shared in the success. In other cases, foot soldiers used the area of operations to their advantage. They attacked the heavy knights in situations where the knights couldn't use their strengths. People also wrote a lot about how vulnerable armored knights were when their first attack failed or if they fell off their horses. The increased use of ranged weapons like bows, crossbows, and firearms took away the knights' military advantage. Firearms, especially cheap guns, made war more modern. Success in battle became less about social status and wealth, and more about equipment. With a gun, even a simple farm boy could shoot a noble knight off his horse. Who decides the war? Heroes and cowards. Heroes are created mainly in stories about war, not in the war itself. War is life-threatening and dangerous, cruel, hard, and full of hardships. People die and kill others. Yet, war has a strange fascination. By fighting against a powerful and evil enemy, one can prove oneself and show what one is made of. It's not through clever arguments or creative skills, but through strong actions that a hero shows himself. In European culture, war and proving oneself in battle are seen as the starting point for social recognition. A successful warrior gains social reputation from his deeds. The path to fame leads over the bodies of enemies. Nothing can bring as much honor as the successful use of fighting. Whoever kills many enemies is considered an honorable hero. Knights and tough fighters had the potential to become heroes. Heroes fight alone. In medieval stories, we clearly see how being a hero is linked to fighting. A hero must fight, and he must do it alone. He doesn't want to fight in a group or in tight formations, but by himself. A duel, where two characters face each other, is the best way to make heroes. In a group, individual achievements get overlooked. It's only heroic if a hero has to fight against many. The same idea applies to commanders. Many medieval sources try to connect noble leaders with actual fighting. We find kings and dukes not on a hill far away, but right in the middle of the battle. Their heroic qualities were seen not in giving orders, but in taking action. Even in the Middle Ages, battles weren't decided by one person's actions. Their heroic qualities were seen not in giving orders, but in taking action. Even in the Middle Ages, Battles weren't decided by one person's actions. Yet, in many medieval stories, battles and military actions are shown as duels or individual acts. Focusing on certain individuals and highlighting heroic moments was part of the storytelling tradition in medieval histories. So, we heard very little about ordinary foot soldiers and usually only heard about the enemy's retreat and cowardice. Because of this way of telling, 
a battle breaks down into a series of duels. Military actions are often credited to one person, even though they were actually done by a group of fighters. Heroes suffer. Heroes are not only brave and victorious. A true hero can also suffer. And the wars of the Middle Ages gave fighters plenty of chances to do that. The true greatness of a hero shows not only in triumph, but also in failure, because there are tragic heroes too. We read about such heroes in medieval literature again and again. Roland falls in battle against his enemies. Siegfried dies because of the intrigues at the royal court of worms. The tragic side of heroes had a comforting role for the war-making society. Suffering became meaningful. Medieval society honored military success with prestige and rewards. The link between honor, heroism, and failure doesn't mean that medieval warrior heroes aim to fail. Even though literary heroes often have a tragic side, failure was never the goal of their heroic actions. Violence was meant to be inflicted on others, not suffered oneself. Through the reward in the afterlife, failure and death gained a comforting aspect. In the Christian understanding of death, dying for the cause of faith became the reward for the brave Christian. Injuries and Captivity Soldiers didn't just die in war. They could also be injured, mutilated, or taken prisoner. Medieval writings mention injuries mainly when important fighters were hurt or when they wanted to show how terrible the war was. Being captured was often not as bad physically, but could ruin a medieval fighter financially. If the captors could get ransom money, the prisoner usually stayed alive, but sometimes they still got hurt. High-ranking fighters who were captured were usually treated well. They were treated according to their status, and sometimes even had their own servants with them. They could promise not to run away, so they didn't have to be locked up in a dungeon. It was very different for prisoners who were not famous or important. Types of War Battles, Sieges, and Campaigns In the Middle Ages, war looked very different depending on the time and place. The goal was always to win, but people used different methods to get there. We can mainly distinguish three types of war. Battles, sieges, and war campaigns. These didn't happen separately, but often overlapped and affected each other. The same soldiers who besieged cities also went on campaigns to destroy the enemy's land. They used different weapons and acted differently depending on the situation, so we can describe these three types of war separately. The Battle No other part of medieval war has as many records as battles. However, battles were not the most important or common form of warfare in the Middle Ages. This might seem strange at first, but it can be explained by how written sources were made and by what the authors were interested in. When medieval historians described military actions that often lasted a long time, they focused on the battles. This gives the impression that battles were the most important part of medieval war. Other aspects of war, like recruiting and moving troops, or what they did before and after battles, are often not mentioned at all, or only briefly simply because describing a battle is more exciting than describing an army on the move. But if you look at the war careers of individual commanders and kings, a different picture emerges. Even very famous war heroes of their time took part in very few field battles. Medieval commanders and fighters might have been experienced in war, but they were usually not hardened by many battles. Only a few fighters had the experience of many battles. While war was relatively common, so-called open field battles were rather rare. Our modern understanding of a field battle is strongly shaped by our image of the wars of the 19th century. Wars in that time seemed to be mainly fought on battlefields and were decided in concentrated actions. Victory and defeat led to political changes. Land was not conquered meter by meter, but was given up after a decisive battle. This form of war is also found in the Middle Ages and is typical of the first phase of the so-called Hundred Years' War between England and France. Even though the situation in the Parliament was clear, putting this treaty into practice was difficult. Rule had to be enforced on the spot, which could mean dealing with relatively small enemy groups like castle garrisons. When a battle happened, it was mainly a big chaos, 
Many actions by different people happened at the same time, with and against each other. They were hard to oversee, but also full of tactics and planning. It was certainly very hard to keep track and know where you were. William of Poitiers, along with many medieval historians, points out the limits of written descriptions. We do not have the ability, nor is it our intention, to report the heroic deeds of each individual as they deserve. The amount to report would be difficult to manage in every detail, even for the most eloquent who had seen that battle with their own eyes. In some ways, medieval battles were different from our image of war. One problem was telling friend from foe. In the chaos of battle, when formations broke apart, you couldn't tell who you were fighting. Uniforms in the modern sense did not exist, and tunics decorated with coats of arms were only somewhat helpful in close combat. They were hard to recognize without knowing their coat of arms and their loyalty. The Siege No other form of war shows the range of what was possible in medieval times as clearly as sieges. In sieges, we find noble agreements between warriors, but also cruel massacres. William of Tyre describes the conquest of Jerusalem by the Crusaders in 1099 as a Christian triumph over the non-believers. It was horrifying to see how the dead lay everywhere, and parts of human limbs, and how the ground was completely covered with spilled blood. And not only the mutilated bodies and the severed heads were a terrible sight. The greatest horror was that the victors themselves were covered in blood from head to toe. A great god granted the crusaders a triumphant victory over the non-believers. In this situation, there was no negotiation. In the war against those who did not share their faith, violent force could break out without restraint. It is also clear that Christian authors could more easily tell stories of unrestrained violence against non-Christians. It is hard to say whether wars between Christians and non-Christians were fought more cruelly than wars between Christian opponents. What could be the standard for such a comparison? But it is certain that from a Christian perspective, the rules of war only applied in fights against other Christians. When Christian blood was spilled, the victor's triumphant behavior was more subdued. The range of weapons and methods of violence used in sieges was enormous. The technological development of a society is perhaps always most advanced in the areas that serve war. Hunger as a weapon. Perhaps the most important weapon in the siege of a fortified place was the hunger of those inside. Well-fortified castles could only be taken in battle with heavy losses. It was more efficient, though very demanding, to cut off the defenders from many supplies. Completely sealing off a larger city, however, was extremely difficult. For example, in 1428 and 1429, the English troops failed to completely surround the French city of Orléans and prevent French reinforcements from arriving. Finally, a peasant girl led French troops into the city, and she would decisively shape the future of the French-English conflicts. The appearance of this woman was perhaps unusual, but the incomplete siege ring was not. In sieges, the defenders were often forced to surrender by starvation. For many sieges, we have information about drastically rising food prices, which give a clear picture of the war economy and hint at the consequences for the suffering population. Even for the fighting troops, hunger was often a constant companion. A common tactic during sieges was for the besieged to drive out the non-fighting parts of the population from the fortress. In this way, they wanted to reduce the demand for food in the city and at the same time put pressure on the besiegers. The besiegers were then faced with the moral demand to care for these people, but that would have shifted the balance in favor of the besieged. At least in the theory of wartime conventions, it was unthinkable to harm these people. The Campaign Medieval armies didn't just fight in sieges and battles. They also marched across the land. These campaigns probably took up a very significant, if not the longest, part of medieval warfare. The first goal of any campaign was to get the soldiers to where they needed to fight. Usually, they had to travel a certain distance between the gathering point and the battlefield. Transporting troops by ship was a special challenge. It was expensive and took a lot of time because they had to wait for good weather and wind. Even with small medieval armies, this meant a huge 
logistical effort. The troops' discipline had to be maintained, and the route had to be scouted, all of this with a very underdeveloped infrastructure compared to today. People, weapons, war equipment, and food for both humans and animals had to be transported. Food also had to be obtained from the surrounding area, either by paying for it or by force. During marches over land, especially larger armies seemed to commonly march in separate columns. This had the advantage that they could gather food over a wide area from the countryside. Also, the different units could help each other or come together for a joint attack. When possible, medieval commanders tried to live off the land. However, if the campaign aimed to conquer the land, this approach wasn't always problem-free. The territory and the people they wanted to rule over shouldn't be completely plundered or turned against the new rulers by violent attacks. Plundering and Devastation Campaigns didn't just serve to bring an army from one place to another to fight there. The journey itself could also be the goal. Armies moved through enemy territory to plunder and burn. This had different names. Through plundering, the soldiers could enrich themselves. We've already seen that loot was a key motivation for participating in war. In the case of devastation, the situation was different. Here, it wasn't about personal gain, but about causing as much damage as possible to the enemy. The strategy of devastation aimed to take away the enemy army's means of living, making it unable to fight. This could happen before a siege, when unprotected suburbs were torn down and burned. Entire campaigns could also follow this idea. A trail of devastation, visible from afar through fire and smoke, accompanied many medieval armies. In the Hundred Years' War, relatively small English units moved plundering and singing through France. These actions were called chevauchées, which means rides in French. The goal of these chevauchées wasn't to confront the enemy in battle or to conquer territory. Besides getting loot, it was about undermining the other side's claim to power. For medieval people, one of the most important and noble duties of a king was to protect his subjects. If English troops could devastate the heartland of France unchecked, without the French crown stopping them or facing them in battle, this weakened the king's authority. Violence in War Reports War and violence are inseparable, so it's not surprising when war reports talk about violence. However, texts that discuss war but avoid mentioning violence seem strange because they feel cynical and uncaring. In those texts, War turns into a kind of game where winning is all that matters. But the way to get there is mostly ignored. It's different with texts that openly talk about violence. Mentioning successful acts of violence is meant to highlight the fighting skills of one's own side. Violence entertains the reader when it boosts their confidence. The key for violence to entertain the audience is its nature. It must be good violence. This means it must be justified in the context of war, should not cross existing boundaries and norms, and must be directed against a worthy opponent. Also, violence must be used successfully. The more enemies a hero can kill, the more entertaining his actions are. The entertainment value of violence here depends on its connection with a hero. Especially in epic stories, medieval authors had no problem describing warlike violence in great and vivid detail. The same goes for medieval book illustrations. Their pictures leave little to the imagination and show warlike violence in all its bloody details. These visual depictions probably matched the reality of medieval war as little as the epic tales did. The violent one is always the enemy. This is shown by how the enemy is portrayed unfairly in the stories. They are shown doing things that go beyond accepted norms, making their position unjust. This brings us to a typical point in medieval reports of war crimes. Only the others commit wrongdoings. This clearly shows that in war reports, each side wants to make themselves look good and the enemy look bad. What matters is not the intensity of the violence, but its context. Certain forms of violence define injustice, especially attacks on people who were considered worthy of protection. Attacks on sacred places are also condemned. For modern readers, these descriptions say a lot about the author's ideas about violence 
and the reasons behind the story. Many violent stereotypes appear that can be attributed to the enemy, acts like cannibalism and all that, even in front of the victim's children. An image of violence that appears repeatedly in the Middle Ages is burning a church with people inside. In the Christian world, such an act breaks several taboos at once. It violates a sacred place, dashes the hopes of believers who sought refuge in God's protection, and kills defenseless people. It's interesting to see how long-lasting these images of violence have been in the Western world. Violence affects everyone. The victims of war. When we ask about the war situations in which non-combatants became victims in the Middle Ages, we find that medieval and modern conflicts are similar. Violence against non-combatants was also deliberately used by medieval commanders to achieve war goals. Many attacks were likely due to lack of discipline or were simply accepted, but from the behavior and reports of medieval commanders, it becomes clear that they also intentionally targeted non-combatants. The opposite behavior is also recorded. By sparing the defeated, remaining enemies were supposed to be convinced to surrender. Indirect violence against non-combatants often hides in casual remarks. The victims of war also include the families left behind by fallen soldiers. War created widows and orphans. We can no longer count the number of victims among non-combatants or measure the extent of their harm or suffering today. To find out the number of victims, we usually rely on historical writings. Here we face the same problems we had with the numbers about army sizes. The numbers are hard to determine and are also distorted. How did people know how many fighters had died? For several battles, it's reported that after the fight, the battlefield was searched for the dead and wounded. They looted the dead or looked among the wounded for potential ransom candidates. Many fighters lost their lives in the Middle Ages. Participants in a battle or siege always risked being killed. This risk varied depending on social status and role in the army, the place and type of war, and was especially dependent on victory or defeat. A knight who was victorious in a war between Christians certainly had much better chances of survival than a peasant fighting as a foot soldier who was defeated by an enemy of a different faith. Their status protected the knights, as did their armor. They were more valuable than simple foot soldiers, and therefore worth sparing. Also, they were harder to kill. Violence Against Women War is not just a phenomenon or an event. It is made by people. In medieval wars, it was mostly men who fought each other. Although women sometimes participated actively, this was rare and was noted accordingly, like in the case of the so-called Maid of Orléans. While active warfare was almost exclusively a man's affair, women were often the victims of war. If the heathens had defeated us like this, they wouldn't have treated the defeated more cruelly. It didn't help the women that they had fled into the churches and brought their belongings there, for the men had fled into the forests or wherever else they could hope to find safety. The women were violated even in the churches, even when they had fled to the altar. And when, in barbaric fashion, their lust was satisfied, they burned the women along with the churches. The violence of war affected not only women, but also male non-combatants. They were driven away and had to hide in the forests or were taken away for ransom. In medieval ideas about family and the legal position of men, the violation of a woman was also always an attack against the man who was unable to protect his wife and thus failed in his role as the head of the family. In this way, the defeated were shown their helplessness and powerlessness very clearly. Our Image of the Middle Ages Our modern image of medieval war is not only shaped by the bias of the sources, as described at the beginning. Since the Romantic era, the European Middle Ages have been idealized and seen as an escapist counterpoint to our own time. People escape into a past that seems structured and reliable, especially compared to a modern world perceived as confusing and overly complex. Back then, there were clear family structures and bonds. People knew where they stood and where they belonged, 
Added to this is a cozy fascination with the living conditions, which are interpreted as being close to nature and authentic. So, one can take a little break in the Middle Ages in the form of movies, books, or medieval fairs. The image of war that we encounter in many films and stories is anything but nuanced, instead focusing on certain aspects. This applies not only to the wars of the Middle Ages, but to all eras. War appears as a terrible, but ultimately unavoidable means of communication in the dialogue between friend and foe. It becomes a backdrop for heroes, and thus loses its horror. When attention focuses on the successful actors, the victims fade into the background. The popular image of medieval warfare sits right at the intersection of the romanticized Middle Ages and entertaining combat. Referring to the narrative patterns of medieval historians mentioned earlier, we can state that the connection between war and heroism was very successful. From ancient times to today, war history is told as the history of heroes. If we want to free our image of medieval war from these interpretations and get closer to reality, then things become more complex. Then, war primarily produces deaths, and no heroes.